So welcome back to another um, episode of the Chronic Pain Club talk show here live on YouTube on Sunday evenings. I'm delighted to be joined this week uh, by Ian Tavener, also known as Mr. Uh, Cookfulness. And we'll be talking tonight. <laughs> yes, the T-shirt shows. <laughs> we'll be talking tonight about how he uses something like cooking to help manage um, long term pain, um, as well as um you know, getting a bit of understanding about the um, the backstory behind behind that pain. And also, I'm very much looking forward to hearing about all the wonderful things that Ian does to help raise awareness and 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 inspire other people. So welcome, Ian. How are you? Thank you very much. I, I'm really good. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Yes, I'm good. I'm good. But this part of the week, I'm always a little bit flustered, but <laughs> I feel like I feel like I'm ready <laughs> to, to end the week off on, on a high. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, obviously, we've I think we've crossed paths a few times. It's the first time I've been we've been able to get actually on a call. So I'm I'm really excited about this purely from like a personal point of view. Um, so we won't dive too much into detail because we're gonna go through all of that, but just for anyone that has never never met you before do you want to just give like an overview of um you know where you're from and 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 who you are and then we'll we'll dive into your um sort of the health backstory thank you yeah so i'm ian tavner i am mr cookfulness and i i grew up in the isle of man many many moons ago so i'm a i'm an islander um traveled around with my my work before settling now in the in southampton the south coast uh where everything changed because of illness um and and now i'm sort of using my experiences to help people find a bit of joy in the kitchen brilliant um thank you that was perfect <laughs> because then it allows us to go through about going into too much detail so thank you you've obviously done this before <laughs> um, so w before we get into the cooking side which i'm sure a lot of people are here to uh, here to hear um how did where did your story start with you know we can put cover I, I understand you've got a couple of health conditions but you know we yeah. can focus on the pain bit but where did all of that that start for you if you don't mind sharing no not at all um it, it started looking back in, in my late sort of mid to late 30s um so about 15 years ago um at the time didn't see it but now i can look back and see where it came from so initially it was my my mental health that that started to go first so dealing with anxiety um, and panic attacks, which I'd never had before. And that that was a real big shock to me, but it, it just seemed like that was what was happening. And I sort of just shoved it away. And in those days, you didn't talk about those sort of things. Um, and then I remember I came back, from, I, I used to work in financial services. And um, I, uh, I came back off a trip and I just got this awful pain in my chest. It just wouldn't go away. Um, and I thought, oh, what the heck is this? So I went to the doctors and they they sort of said, oh, well, let's get you in and sort of tubes in everywhere and whatever. And uh, many, it was almost about five or six months before anything actually happened. And they just by chance saw that I had celiac disease, so I couldn't have gluten or wheat. And they said, oh, that's it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but it wasn't it. And it, it carried on. And, and it started to just get worse and worse and worse over time. And the pain was spreading. And my mental health was deteriorating. And I think probably after two or three more years, it just crashed. Um, and, and I was actually in hospital going in for another sort of stab in the neck with some injections and I just broke down completely. Uh, and, and that was the, the big drop really. That, that it's really refreshing obviously it's a horrible experience but it's so refreshing to have another male on this show <laughs> sharing the mental health bit because you know i look back at my story and you know i developed i didn't get the psoriatic arthritis bit of my condition until my mid-20s but that was preceded by a massive mental health issue and i went through early intervention and i had depression it was it was i think it was like diagnosed as like a form of psychosis but yeah. now looking back in hindsight yeah, I was flaring and I didn't know how to handle it. And I had to say thank you for coming on and 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 just straight off the bat, you know, saying <laughs> that because um it will help people out there. Well, yeah, and and I think that for a long time I hid all of that. I hid the mental health side, and it was the physical bit that that I thought, well, that that's something people can can get to grips with. I didn't really want to share it even with my family. Um, but now I've um, I've flipped that completely around, and the mental health side I think is just as important. Um, and it, it, it's it's crucial in managing that every day. It's just as hard as managing your, your physical health. Yeah, it yeah, really is. And, and like I say, for a lot of our conditions, they are interlinked. And, and yeah. it's, it's Stress Awareness Month, and we all know how that, that links in as well and, and feeds yeah. a lot of this stuff. So you obviously um, you went through all that experience. And um, 
so the am I right? I think you've got a um sort of neurological disorder. Was was that the first bit, or was it um was it the other conditions that came? Like the first the that? first thing I had, and it and it, it it was almost by they tried everything else, uh, and we we really don't can't find a sort of physical condition. Then they said, oh, it, go to this pain person. They'll they'll know. Um, and it was um they said, oh, you've got fibromyalgia, and I said, I have no idea what that is. Um, looked it up and thought, well, that looks like it could be it because it's sort of suggesting what's going on. But it didn't feel like everything, and it just felt like that was it. Now, you've got a label, off you go. And there wasn't really a lot of help for that. And I think, unfortunately, by knowing, I got worse because I knew I had something, but I didn't know what to do, <laughs> and I didn't know how to deal with it. And I ended up more and more of a recluse as a result. Um, and I think it was only it was only another couple of years later where – I was diagnosed with functional neurological disorder um, because I was getting tremors and um, seizures uh, as well as the pain. And that that just didn't seem right to fit with, with the fibro side. Uh, and then once I got that diagnosis, it was like, right, OK. And arthritis at the same time, because I'd had some scans and they found that my hips were just basically crumbling to bits. Um, so I had to have both hips replaced in my sort of mid 40s. Um, which again was an experience that I didn't enjoy because it was supposed to be like, oh, great, you can you can move again, but everything else was just you know crashing in on top. So all of that with the depression, anxiety created a really sort of sort of tsunami of, of, yeah. of pain and anguish, really. And and how was that? Because obviously there's 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 multiple angles there, and we know particularly in this country things can be a little bit siloed. Um, <laughs> so I'm probably making an assumption about your experience here. But how was that? Yeah. How was that managed when you presumably you got rheumatology and neurology and you know all all them other things going on? What was it? Yeah. A joined up approach, or oh, was it mixed no. messages from everyone? It, it was the silo of all silo. I mean, it was unbelievable, and I didn't know any different either. And and we you get sent to one appointment and they'd say, right, we're going to be dealing with this bit. And you'd come home and then you'd get off to another bit, maybe three months later, and then you'd be somewhere else. And then they'd say, oh, yeah, we need to help you with your depression. And then I'd go somewhere else, but none of it was joined. Um, so I probably maybe got a day or two of, yeah, that's a good idea, until everything else all wrapped on itself again. So probably three or four years of this, of the silos, before someone finally decided to change that which was when i went to bath to the the pain center there well, they, they do they do wonderful things there but yeah. um, I, I've, i'm not interacting with them personally but i hear lots and lots of good things but and i'm guessing up until that point nobody thought to ask about mental health or signpost you to mental health support or no. factor that in how that was impacting you no not at all um and and no one even said that this could be the situation even though right at the very beginning the anxiety and the panic attacks were what was triggering what, well, where it all began. And you know, I, I was meant, I would talk about that all the time, but it was almost just put to the side that said, oh, it, it, it's the pain that's doing this and here we go. But even then it wasn't any help because no one really knew what to do with it. Yeah, and, and, and the whole time you're just left in limbo trying to work out what's what. <laughs> yeah. And... yeah, and with uh, my wife and we had two young daughters at the time, and it's really difficult because they grew up with a dad that they didn't really see very much because I was either sort of shut away in the bedroom under the covers because I, I thought that was the right way to cope with it. I, I thought it would be best for them if they didn't see me in pain. Um, and it, we sort of created a sort of detached family within a family. So they carried on doing what they did. And my wife unbelievably did everything for so long, uh, caring for me and looking after them, looking back it was the wrong thing to do, you know, because we really needed to try and get ourselves together. But it just felt like that was the way to deal with it because we had no other answers. And and the thing is, you 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 find you find your way through that, but without the guidance, as we all blame ourselves. Like every single one of us that live these long term health conditions are constantly, um, you know, putting things on our own shoulders. But um, but if you aren't getting that that support to signpost you or show you a better way to manage it, um, and and how did um. How was like the pain side of that treat? Because you know, as somebody who's had experience as myself, and there's lots of people in the in this community talk a lot about you know yeah. being told just keep taking your painkillers, keep taking your pain. Did you have a sort of similar experience? It was medication and um, injections, and you know everything. There was nothing around other ways to deal with it other than we'll keep piling up the medication and 
obviously looking back, the more you, you get used to the medication, the more you need. And the more you need, the worse it was my mental health was getting because these things were just getting, I was on, you know, I had patches all over my back. I was taking opioids. I had, you name it, was going on. And I partially don't remember a lot of what was going on because I was so full of this stuff. Um, it was affecting me that I, I couldn't function. I didn't know what was going on, but it was, you just take for granted that it's the right thing to do to take these things because they tell you this will be good. Have some of this, or let's get you into hospital and we'll put some, you know, some steroids in you and, and you, in your neck or whatever. And that, that should help it. And that's what happens. And we, we sort of call it here in our house, the groundhog years, because the days just kept doing the same thing over and over again. It was medication, sleep, maybe say hello, medication, sleep, maybe say hello. And that's pretty much what happened for a long time. And the thing is that that obviously then just sends your, your mental health spiral and as well. And trust me, yeah. I've I've very much been there where I felt like yeah. I'd lost everything and yeah. and 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 I used to get um a lot of like I say, keep taking your painkillers, keep taking painkillers. And at the time I'd just become a dad and I just felt like a zombie. I just wasn't I wasn't yeah. present and then that would affect my mental health. And and I don't know about you, I find the more the more I was medicated and the lower my mood was, the more negative effects I then had from <laughs> from being yeah. on that on that stuff because yeah. you know i was waking up in the middle of the night you know because if you have a negative thoughts and you're taking all this this stuff then obviously it's not going to help feed into that is it no absolutely and and you just get sort of you, you look forward to the next patch going on because it's going to help you you think but actually all you all it's really doing is feeding your habit of try, of, of needing this stuff but it, it, you don't really need it for, for the right reasons. I <laughs> think. And, and I, when I went through sort of trying to come off some of these things, my God, it was awful. You know, but, but I knew at the end of it that I'd feel a lot better as a result. And when I came off some of these, these opioids and patches, I actually felt better than I did when I was on them, which does, it sounds wrong, but I, I think because mentally, it, as you said, it taken me down an awful path. So yes, my pain probably was a bit worse, but I felt so much better in my head as a result. <laughs> And, and did you find you got any sort of like education with any? Oh, yeah, it's horrible because I already I'm I'm half laughing because I already know what the answer is going to be from where. <laughs> yeah. it's but yeah. you know, so when you were given this stuff, were you were you told what it was trying to achieve? Were you told if it was long, short term, what the desired outcome, what et cetera, et cetera, or was it literally just just take this whilst we work? No, and I I never I didn't know what was for mental health, what was for physical health. I just took them because it was this is this is you know what you're supposed to have and now obviously if I had my time again I'd go and ask what are all these for what does that do but when you're in a position where you're not functioning anyway you don't ask you don't want to take just to try and help um so yeah no I didn't get any, any sort of thoughts as to what it was I was I was taking and and I think the good thing is though for people today is like this sort of stuff exists what you're doing what I'm doing I think you only have to go back five years or so and it was just it just it wasn't there and, and I remember saying to my wife like when I started all of this is it was literally because I didn't want anyone else to go down that route I had of being completely uninformed not involved in any decisions just being a passenger to sort of like my own care and and so sort of my my big change was getting onto like pain management and pain management therapy and stuff like that um what was your change because clearly what you're doing today is very similar reasons i'm guessing because of the same as me so so yeah. what what changed things for you well it was when i i went i say i went to the bath um pain center and i was on a four-week residential program and and i went in with no expectations because I, I i've been on so many things that just didn't do anything but they were the first who said right we're looking at everything here we're looking at physical health mental health we're going to sort of unpick a little bit and try and get you back. And they asked, I just remember specifically a question they asked me, what did I want? And I, I was like, what? <laughs> What's, what kind of a question is that? And I, and I, I said, I, don't, I want to be well. They said, no, let's be realistic. What do you want? And I just thought, and I said, you know what? I want to be back part of my family again. I'd love to be, the word you use, present in my family again. And they said, right, that's the easy bit. Now what are you going to do to get there? And, and cooking was what I thought, oh, do you know what? I used to like cooking. If I can start cooking again, maybe I'll be visible because I'll have to get up. I'll, I'll be making breakfast. I'll be making lunch and whatever. This will be perfect. I'll, I'll do cooking. And that was what I thought would be a great way back, not realizing how hard it was going to be to actually do it. But it gave me the, the oomph to say, right, I, want, I always have in my head my family now. 
Um, and I have a, a, a sort of picture which I always, always bring back, which is um, around the dinner table, there's four chairs and my wife and my two daughters are on one and, and my one's missing. And that was the years where I wasn't around. So now it's, I'm going to be on that chair. You know, come rain, hail or shine, I'll be on that chair. So it always motivates me to say, right, that's the chair I'm going to be in. How am I going to do it each day? So that that, that was really where it all started from. That's an amazing image. And, and it's like having that, like I, I often talk about, if I didn't have my son, so my, my permanent pain issue started literally the same month my son was born. And I'm sure stress was a part of that. Um, yeah. But I always argue, I like, I, I genuinely am, I don't even want to think about where I would be if that hadn't have coincided with me becoming a dad, because I don't know what my, you know, I, I, it sounds horrible for my poor wife, but like I just can't imagine like any, anything pulling me out of that place that I was other than seeing that baby. And yeah, um, yeah so that, that, that really resonates with me. I'm quite emotional hearing you say, that. <laughs> um, you know, um, and I think it's really important for people to understand that it's just like whatever you've got to find something that you love and care about. It's like for me, it was writing. Yours was cooking. And yeah. and it really doesn't and it doesn't have to be comfortable, does it? Like, obviously, no. you've probably found lots of ways to adapt. But you said yeah. it was like quite difficult at first. So do you want to maybe talk yeah. a little bit about that? Journey? Oh, I mean, I, it was a disaster, to be brutally honest. With you. <laughs> I mean, everything that that sort of came at me I, you sort of realize how how wrong the kitchen is for people who are suffering physically or mentally because it's it's inaccessible there's there's hot things heavy things and there's lots of things that want to stab you so it's not a great place um and i i found that i couldn't do everything a lot of things that i'd done before and so initially it was like oh god here's another thing i'm gonna have to stop doing because it's just not working and my wife almost sort of physically accosted me and said get back in there and you're going to do this and you know you know you can do this because there are ways and that and I started to work on well if that's not working for me what could I do is there anything I could do and there weren't really any sort of cookbooks out there that because I'd sort of lost my ability to freestyle food I couldn't just think of something the sort of brain functional and the fog wouldn't allow me to go oh yeah let's just chuck this all and I had to follow a recipe and I'd open a book and look at it and this just is making no sense to me it's all it's sort of gobbledygook or I get halfway through and not really know what was going on so it was my wife encouraged me to say right un, unwind everything go backwards go back to that feeling of you want to start cooking again and how would you do it you know forget about what other people are doing what would you do and I was like oh hello I've got I've got a bit of a free go at this so I started to put down ways of how I was looking at it and it sort of turned into a into a cookbook out of sort of nowhere. And I just did it really as a passion to help me drive. And then my wife said, well, why don't you publish it? And I said, like, yeah, right, that's a good idea. Who's going to buy this? But I self-published it. Um, and it, it, it sort of springboarded to where, to where I am now. So the book came out and things started to, to get a bit more interesting. And people were sort of like, well, let's see who this guy is behind behind this yellow book. Uh, and it sort of it sort of went from there, but it came from things going awfully wrong. So thinking, well, hang on, I've got a, that picture of that table with the four chairs. I've got to be in it. So what am I going to do to get there? That's yeah, it's just amazing. And guys, anyone watching this back, either the recording or the audio version, we'll put a link to all of um, Ian's Ian's work where you can find these things um, in the in the show notes and description. Um, but I suppose what I want to sort of just pick it a little bit, Ian, is like. I'm guessing when you started off doing the cooking, you've done it because it was a previous passion and you've done it for you. You probably never saw it ever going on to help other people. Am I right in thinking that? Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. And it, it sort of, it was my way of getting back in. And I remember the first thing I made, and I think I just made some toast and I hadn't done that for so long. And my daughters just went, yeah. And I was like, what? And they said, it's just so good to see you here. And it was like, and that feeling of making something so small and celebrating it so highly has, has stuck with me. But yeah, it, it's it was never any thought that this could go anywhere other than it was more to it was to help me and the family. And then it, it, I think once the book came out and we started seeing reactions of people from all different walks of life saying, actually, I'm finding this really helpful uh, and this is really useful. It suddenly thought, wow. Or if it's helping me and it's helping them, maybe it's going to help other people as well. And that's really where the sort of springboard came. Yeah. And 
yeah it just did you find then there was like this like correlation between you exploring that that you know that because for me i find when i'm being creative my ability to distract myself from my pain is just like tenfold better did you did you have a yeah. similar experience and and, yeah. and how did that then look as you explored that in terms of your pain medication or how, how you sort of manage your conditions yeah, it, 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 it had a, a major effect because the more I sort of was finding ways to cook, the more I wanted to cook and the more my mental health was, was starting to look up a little bit and I was starting to feel excited about things. I was starting to feel a little bit of, a little bit of pride and a bit of self-worth, the words I'd never even thought about for years because they just weren't things that I associated with myself. Um, and, it, and it sort of, became that well actually this is this is something and because i was doing more probably feeling more with it i went to the doctors and i said look i'd like to look at some of the medication i'm on you know can it can it come down a bit because i'm starting to feel a little bit more positive and to be fair my gp was brilliant he said look we've got to take this slow We've got to pick out the ones that are going to be the ones that aren't going to throw you off kilter because we don't want to drop you back where you've been. So it was, you know, it took a long, long time, but it did start from a conversation of, I, I think I can manage my physical and me mental health a bit better myself, so I don't necessarily need as much medication. And and sometimes I'd come down and think, oh, I've gone too far. We need to come back up again. Um, but it did help. The sort of the more I was going this way, the more the uh, the sort of medication was was coming down a bit but it took a couple of years before I was able to come you know and I'm still on you know quite an array of medication but it's at a level that I feel comfortable with now and I, I feel happy with and I, and maybe someday I'll come down a bit more but at the moment why would you upset the apple cart when things are just about <laughs> where we want them and it's just a fine balance. I think it's really important for anyone listening to this. There is a place for medicine and there is a place for painkillers. And I have yeah. to lean on painkillers occasionally when yeah. things flare and everything else. But what we're talking about here is that that power that if you can find something you love to do to act as a way of like um, a distraction for me, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Like my, my wife will be so bored of hearing this, but it's like genuinely the whole advocacy thing and finding my voice and writing and doing yeah. this talking to amazing people like you Ian it is literally it gets me out of bed in the morning because it it that's you need that something to look forward to don't you and, and clearly oh, for you it's cooking with, without doubt and you know and this and likewise being on on your show is just fantastic because I'm you know I'm I know there's people who'll be watching this who'll be, who, who might not want to say anything but they're hopefully going to find one little nugget that says maybe I can try that now, I never had that. You never had that. That's why we're doing what we're doing, to try and help people find those things. And I've always said to people, you know, if I say 10 things and nine of them you think are absolute codswallop, well, that's fine. But if one of them's, oh, well, maybe I can use that, then then it's happy days for me, you know, and for you, I'm sure it's the same thing. Yeah. And 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 the thing is, the learner never ends as well. Like, you know, that that no. that dining table chair image thing is just going to stick with me and i think that's that's a great one and and you've already sort of said something tonight which i'm constantly banging the drum about about that whole <clears throat> excuse me like asking me what i need what not yeah. what hurts and and yeah. for you to get that moment going down to bath where they asked that question which clearly you weren't prepared for but it is he said <laughs> what's what sort of question this is the best question it's just you yeah. wouldn't have known it at the time no. um it, that that gives me tremendous hope so i think anyone watching this guys who are in a lot of pain or just feeling hopeless and we've all been there um these things are changing slowly aren't they and yeah. you I, you know I, um i can't remember now off the top of my head i've got a bit of brain fog today the um the time scale you said but i'm presuming you you see a difference in when you go to see your um, clinicians now in terms of the questions they're asking compared to when you first started this journey yeah totally and and even from when you know going to the doctors or going in to see them is a is a better experience than it was before um i still have the issues where if i go in with something that isn't to do with it that it's a more automatically related back to what you've got or oh, it's probably to do with your arthritis <laughs> or your fnd is like i don't think it is <laughs> but but now i'm able to articulate that a little better um and and i feel that i by being able to question a bit more I have a better relationship with my with my clinicians than before because it was very one way um, originally. But now 
I still, you know, find it hard to question someone and say, well, he must know what he's doing or she's, she must know what's going on. But actually, I can now feel like saying to them, what does this do? And what would happen if I didn't take it is the biggest question I now ask. What would be the result of me not having this? And that, that baffles them sometimes because it's like, well, you'll stay like you are. I said, but if I have it, then what, what, what happens? Will my pain improve? But what's going to happen to, my, you know, to the old noggin? Yeah. And it's like, ah, so those are the sort of things that I can ask now because I feel able to, but you can't and, and you don't even know to ask those questions. So I think helping people to arm themselves or even, you know, if you're going with someone to the GP because you, you feel you can't talk or, or can't articulate it, just ask them to ask those questions. It'll help an awful lot and probably save quite a bit of sort of long term um, time that you'll waste sort of trying lots of things until you get to the, to the place you need to be. I think you need to give yourself an awful lot of credit there because one of the things you said in the middle of that was about, um, you know, asking about, OK, physically, but how does it affect my, my mental health? And that is such an important consideration that far too many people don't make that yeah. connection. It took me years to get to that point where, <laughs> you know, where I instead of chasing a magic bullet that I thought was just going to fix the pain bit, I didn't appreciate the impact. And it took being a parent, I think, for me to understand that, well, I can't be a zombie all day, regardless yeah. of what the pain level's like. So, yeah, I think that's really – so give yourself credit for that because not many people get that. Some people don't get there at all. So the fact no, that you've um, – No, I know. No, yeah. and I do feel, I feel genuinely uh, lucky. At, and I try always to not – come across as you know look at me who -hoo, because I know I, I know what it's like so we've all you know we've, we're all I sort of see everybody at different levels along the sort of along the road and I'm just a bit further along but there'll be a lot of people who are right at the beginning and and to, to say to them come on you know snap out of it just doesn't work it's not because I, I, I have to think about what would I have said if someone said that to me yeah. I'd have just gone yeah right yeah. do one <laughs> So, yeah, it, it's constantly reminding yourself that everybody's at di in different places. So when I'm talking about things and trying to help people, I have to always remember how I was and how I could very easily be again if, you know, if I let things go. Yeah. I think it's really important as well that we don't just share all, all the wins. You know, I'm always talking yeah. about the whole real life, not Instagram life or filtered life. <laughs> and and <laughs> I don't always get the nicest messages in my inbox when I share the negative stuff. And that's just like it's important for people to see the bad. So like for for, yeah. for me, this week has been an absolute roller coaster, and I could have just celebrated all the wins and done lots of Photoshop pictures and filtered pictures of me and my son. But somebody out there needs to see that you can do all of this like awareness stuff or be having an impact and still feel like a failure sometimes or make a yeah. mistake or get your pacing wrong or <laughs> you know all that sort of thing. Oh, so I think it's, it's really important to remember that, you know, it, I think to inspire people, it can't just be, the positives it can't just be the standing on a stage bit can it no no i agree and and you know a couple of weeks ago i think we're probably going to touch on it later but i, I had a, sort of a big event that i had to do but three weeks before that i had a massive sort of flare of of my neurological disorder and i lost most of my speech and and it, it was sort of slurring and then i was sort of really struggling and if that had happened you know a couple of weeks later then I wouldn't have been able to do the show. But then I thought, well, actually, doing it like that is real. You know, it's real yeah. life. And 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 what I don't do is when I'm in those sort of situations, I'll try and share this is what's happening. Um, because you're right. If you only show the sort of peaks, people won't necessarily believe you or feel, you know, that they that they understand what you're saying. Um, and I do find that a bit difficult at times when you see this sort of, whoa, look at us, we're all doing fantastically well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like it's not real life you know every day you don't know what's coming um and that's that that's what it's like living with chronic illness <laughs> you just don't know what's coming next and and i find it particularly cruel because like it, there's a lot of evidence to suggest this whole social media thing and the constant notifications and, and best life thing is affecting everybody's mental health negatively so whatever it must be doing to people that are that are um, dealing with an unfair hand that they've been dealt. You know, I just, I'm, I'm so overly conscious of that. And like, it's like when I first started all this on camera stuff, I never used to wear black because I was worried about my psoriasis. And then I thought, yeah. well, no, like I wear black. That's all I pretty much wear. <laughs> Why would I hide it? And, but it took yeah. me a long while to get to that point to feel confident. Um, yeah. But like you say, it's kind of like, it's like you, isn't it? Like, you know, you were invited to that event for a reason, for your background, for your condition and everything else. And then 
we sometimes slip into that apologizing for it and we have to quickly sort of bring ourselves back out. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, totally. And what, what I it, it, sort of some of the events that I do, what's so refreshing is that everybody sort of gets it. That, so you're at those sort of places where people are have a variety of disabilities and illnesses and you think, crikey, yeah, we, you know, there's such a, a world out there of people who are all in different places and struggling at different times and doing different things. So when you get to share that with people, a lot of the times it's people don't understand what you're talking about. But when you sort of like this with a group of people here, you're probably all listening to this going, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I've been there. Or, or yeah, that, that's me. And I think the, the bigger those groups get, the better it's going to be for everybody. So, you know, being here and, and, and you know, looking at what you do, it's amazing. You know, it's fantastic for so many reasons. And it helps you as well, I'm sure, because it gives you that extra boost of, yeah, this is good. You know, and just seeing one comment, it's like, that's really helped me. It's just amazing. <laughs> I often talk about I'm really selfish, you know, it's my therapy. It, it just, you know, and I'm not ashamed to admit that, you know, and if yeah. I can help other people or give create platforms for other people to share their story like you are today, yeah. then then everybody wins. I don't I don't see the um the negative in that. Um no. you've alluded to it, so let's let's get on to that. Um Nadex, <laughs> how did you ever yeah. think when you started cooking that um, toast <laughs> that that you would end up on a stage at Nadex? And maybe just for anyone that isn't familiar, want to maybe explain what what that um expo is and, and and you know how important it is yeah so N nadex is um it's at the nec every year and it's two days and it's europe's sort of largest disability expo and it's a mixture of sort of trade and public i think it began more trades sort of with you know wheelchairs and power chairs and, and assistance etc but it's gone more and more towards the sort of the public side so they they contacted me and said look we'd like to sort of introduce more life real lifestyle type things in it. I was like okay um and they said can we do could you do a couple of cooking demos and I said have you got a kitchen no <laughs> and I was like right <laughs> so, and I thought well, that's fine you know because I, I talk a lot about one of the things I say is widening your kitchen you don't have to be in the kitchen to be cooking you can make food anywhere or prepare it where you feel more comfortable um so I thought well let's you know practice what I preach so I said can I have at least have a plug? And they said, yeah, you can have a plug, but just the one. <laughs> so I had a plug and a table. And 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 it was, so I did, I didn't really know whether people would come along, you know, would, are people going to know who I am? You start, you catastrophize everything. You always do when you've got mental health issues or physical health. So it was like, no one's going to turn up. It's going to be a disaster. I won't know what I'm talking about. Everything's going to go wrong. And then you get yourself worked up into a lather. And I got sort of there and I got set up and I was getting set up and people there was nobody there in my little air in my little theater and I thought oh god this is really bad um and then it just started to creep in people were coming in and I was like oh gosh this is there's more and more and then it was full and I was like oh my god this is worse <laughs> what am I going to do and this technician came out, he, he put the headset on me and a microphone and that paralyzed me because all of a sudden no matter what I did or said it was going to be her and I thought oh no and then I just thought what are the, what are you doing you're just talking about what you do and you love. So let's just go for it. And I just thought, you know what? The worst thing that can happen is I'm making an absolute ass of myself. And that's fine. And I really don't mind because they've come along to, to, to wait to wait. I nearly said to waste their time, to, to, to take some of their time to come in and see me. And I thought, well, let's do it. And so I just started making and to, to think that, as you said, from the man who was trying to, you know, celebrating making a piece of toast. I've, to be able to sort of present these are ways that I, I can help you learn and learn to cook, love to cook, want to cook. It was just like, so it was this pinch me moment. It was massively, you know, huge. And then people coming up afterwards to say, that was great. I really enjoyed that. I'm going to try this. Or what, how did you do that again? And it creates that community again of people wanting to know a bit more about how cooking can become something a bit more than the bit you squeeze into all the other bits. And that's one of the things I really try and push is make cooking a big part of your day. Make it something that you celebrate doing well. Don't make it the bit that you squeeze into everything else because then you're really not going to enjoy it and you're not going to like it. And um, so <laughs> did you like, because I know when I first started doing any sort of public -y kind of stuff, did you find like a bit of a passenger, like surreal when people start giving you good feedback? So you say you yeah. do catastrophize and many of us with these long-term health conditions are a little <laughs> bit sort of like, mentally damaged aren't we from living with yeah. that and everything yeah. 
and then you kind of think what it's a pinch me moment isn't it? and you're like what is yeah. going on um yeah totally and i i i think once i started i started rambling and and i was going off and i too and I, I was sort of talking about things i was jumping around i was going here there and everywhere and I, and I, I suddenly looked at the people who were sat in the front row. They were in, in, in their wheelchairs and they were looking at me and listening to every single word I said. And then I thought, OK, let's just take a, take a breath and, and calm down. And, and one of the things I also talk about is about giving yourself time. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to step back a second, just take a breather and I'll go again. Because I hadn't I don't think I'd taken a breath for two minutes. I was just going. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get it all out and then it and then it like yeah just calm down these let's what am i doing i'm just showing people how to enjoy cooking so let's enjoy it and i just got back to enjoying it and and someone coming up to say i really really enjoyed that was like why <laughs> why <laughs> why did you find that good it's only me and it's like well and it's i still to this day find it very hard to understand why people would come and listen to me talking about stuff but i love it you know i, I love doing it so yeah, and and I think um, I, I think it's not known why that is that that makes you so <laughs> likable and good. You know, like I had someone tell me that once, and I never really um, thought about it too much. But that is, I think that is because there is no ego, and we're doing it for the right reasons, and we're trying yeah. to, you know, make a difference to someone's day. And and yeah, and I think that that comes across. It certainly is coming across tonight, Ian. So uh, yeah, it's just amazing. And it's nice to know that good things can happen to good people. Yeah, and and I think. <laughs> Again, I think I probably hinted that a bit earlier, but I think it's really important for anyone watching this who wants to, you know, you don't have to do stuff on a massive stage or on a massive scale, but just find that one thing that you love or use yeah. a skill. Because there are so many skills that are transferable into the whole awareness and advocacy space that people don't realise. Like for me, it was writing, and then somehow yeah. I end up here tonight talking on camera with purple lights behind me. I don't. That was a bit of a blur how that sort of two years <laughs> unfolded. You know what I mean? But yeah. for you, it was cooking, and for someone else, it might be something else. So, um, yeah, I think it's really important, isn't it, that people just sort of like pull at that thread and just see what because it's a confidence thing as well, isn't it? It gives you that confidence. Certainly, yeah, it is, and and I think sometimes you can think too much about what it is I want to do if you sort of take it to it why do you want to do it and, and then then you'll probably find it somehow and it might be two or three things that you think I'll try one didn't really work that's okay try another one and you know I went through a little stage of writing poetry I've never written poetry in my life but actually it, it allowed me to articulate in sort of written word how I was feeling before I was able to say it verbally so you know, you might find drawing as a thing that is your way. It could be anything. It, you know, it could be fixing cars. It could be whatever it is. But if you find something that gives you a little bit of a, when you think about it and think, oh, I'm looking forward to this, then you're probably on the right track. That is brilliant advice. It really, it really is. Um, and, and then you just pull that thread and see where it takes you guys, like genuinely. Yeah. And um, before we get, because I'm getting lots of questions, people want to know about your toast and what you cooked. And, <laughs> so, before we get on to the, the sort of cook and um, specific side, um, I just wanted to touch slightly on like um, the work you do of like the Footstep Festival stuff and everything, because I'm, I'm quite yeah. new to that whole, you know, I spent the last couple of years talking a lot about mental health and my arthritis and stuff. And, and I've only recently just got the sort of confident i think it's fair to say like courage like to talk about pain because yeah. i don't know about your experience it can be a really delicate subject when you're saying you mentioned it earlier about the whole pull yourself together that's not what we're saying but when yeah. you start saying to people about it being in your head that's a really difficult conversation and and how you manage just that and distract yourself from it and um so it took me a lot of years i think of doing all of this sort of stuff to get that confidence and then i stumbled upon the, the group of people you're involved with like yourself and nikki and yeah. others and it's just like i remember sort of i burst downstairs to my wife after my first sort of interaction with some of you guys and so i said oh my god there's a group that exists that thinks just like me and it's been through that whole pain journey yeah. So, yeah do you want to just maybe explain a little bit about that and the footsteps festival and 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 what that tries to achieve yeah i mean the the, the festival is a it's, it's an online sort of virtual festival and it, it's got everything that a festival has so it's got like i was in the street kitchen it'd have a, a sort of a mindfulness tent it has got a, co a coffee area and whatever so it's set up like that and and initially it was only going to be for a year and 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 they sort of got in touch with me and we were sharing thoughts and ideas about what could i do that might add a bit of value to this festival and it was really offering people 
uh, sort of reactive stuff. So they could go on and have a look and find little areas of resource, but also they had little live events they could go to, but they were also recorded. You know, now on a Monday, they have a, a coffee, coffee and chat evening where you just go in and if you want to just sit and listen, you just sit and listen. And if you want to talk, you can talk. But it's all people who will understand you and will get where you are because they're all at different areas on their sort of road. Um, so they said to me, what about doing some some cooking demos? And I was like, "These are this is before I'd done it. So this was before I'd done any demos. They, they were sort of where I was born from, I guess, in this. And I did um, one because we thought, well, I thought I'll do one. No one will like it. That'll be the end of that. And I did one. And it was pretty awful, to be brutally honest. It wasn't the best. <laughs> so, but we did it. And then we had a sort of a life bit after. We played the video. And then we had a chat afterwards. And it was just extraordinary. People just asking questions about how did you do that? What was that for? People sharing ideas of I would put this in. Why wouldn't you do that? And it's like, this is amazing. So we did a whole series of them. I did sort of six one-hour sessions of making three dishes, lots of chat. All of these are on the Footsteps Festival website as well. So you can, they're all there. You can go on and have a look. And um, all the dishes are there. And then we did another series and then another series. So I've done three series with them of, of, of cook-alongs now. And, and they're just great fun because they're all recorded. They're all set up for people. And if you don't go to the cooking one, they do it's sort of uh, on Zen tangling. They do mindfulness. They do everything. So it's a brilliant resource, all sort of done by people, volunteers who who are like us. You know, they just want to try and help people, and it helps them as well. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, and it's it's like I say for me, it was just such an eye opening thing to find like you know because that that journey is rough, isn't it? For a lot of us, yeah. you know, we we go through that like we've talked about earlier today, and you you've you're told to take all this stuff and then you start realizing there's other ways of managing it. You start trying to peel that back and, and nobody yeah. talks about how horrendous, like you alluded to a little bit earlier about how horrendous that experience can be, whether it's mental health drugs or painkillers. Um, yeah. And if people think it's like class A illegal drugs where people go through that experience, it's really, really not. And I've had yeah. some horrendous ones. So then to find people that just get that and yeah. believe in the other way of trying to cope with it, you know, and then there's no, one one magic bullet here it is a sort of co sort of um sort of let's put it in in terms of dish of you know you take yeah. a bit of what works for you and, yeah. and 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 you find that solution um yeah it just it was i don't know it was a real eye open and um thing for me so i'm so glad i found it. and that ultimately is then what made me um you know stumble across what you were doing and yeah so just all, on behalf of a, as a pain patient thank you to all you guys for everything you've done yeah. with that project yeah they're really brilliant done. They really are brilliant. Um, before I, I'm conscious of time, and it is a Sunday night, and I'm always really grateful anyone that gives up their time. Um, before I let you go, we have got some food-related questions. Are you happy to answer those? Yeah, let's go yeah. for it. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and guys, I suppose this is your final call. If you want to put any more in chat, whichever platform you're watching on, then please do. If they're bonus points, if they could be related to um, to sort of like you know disability adaptions, adjustments, and everything. And I'm probably going to kick off with the first one by saying like, you know what would be the, I don't know, top couple of tips that you'd give for somebody that has got, you know, so I get arthritis in my hands and everything in terms of like trying to make cooking enjoyable when it can be a bit of a frustrating and painful experience. Yeah. Um, a couple of things really, really is, is talk, I talk about sort of smart ingredients, smart equipment. So smart uh, ingredients, I mean, things that are ready chopped for you. So there's a bit of a stigma about frozen ready chopped veg, they shouldn't be because it's brilliant and it's really, really useful. Like chopping, I t every time I talk about this, trying to chop an onion is like, is lethal. You know, you, you try and peel it, you start crying, you try and chop it, fires across the kitchen and you think, and you might, you know, if your hands aren't functioning, it's impossible. So I have a bag of ready chopped onion in my freezer. I always do because nine times out of 10, I can't cut an onion. So I use that. Am I cheating? Hell no, I'm actually doing the right thing. It's brilliant. So, and using ready chopped, some of the frozen veg now, most of it is picked the same time as the fresh, and it's fresher because it's been frozen straight away. So, use it. And things like ready chopped garlic and uh, pastes, I hate it that it's called lazy garlic. It's not lazy garlic, it's very, very clever garlic <laughs> because you know you can get it out and use it, and it gives you a, a boost start to your cooking. Um, so don't be frightened of using ingredients that are going to help you get you further along the stage of, you know, to enjoyment. Because if you start off with something that you hate, you're not going to either you're not going to finish it or you're not going to want to do it. 
Um, secondly, is give yourself some time. Um, you, you tend to feel like you have to rush in the kitchen. You get in there, pressure's on. Oh, no, get your music playing. If you love music, just play it. Yeah. You know, get it going. Get it. Your, all your favorite songs going. Sing along and just take your time with it. Because if you, as I said earlier, if you make cooking a real celebratory part of your day that says, do you know what I've achieved today? I cooked a meal. And that should be the best thing rather than, do you know what I achieved today? Lots of things, but I hate the last bit where I tried to do the meal in the middle. Make the meal the celebratory part of it. No, maybe not every day, but just feel it like, because if I, I now say to my wife, you know what, I've just made dinner for tonight and I feel like absolute rubbish. And it's like, yay, well done. And, that, and you should be proud of it. Cooking is hard. It's really, really hard when you're struggling physically and mentally. So celebrate the hell out of everything you do, even if you burn it, you cremate it, it's a disaster. It doesn't matter. Try and focus on the bit before it where you enjoy getting to that point because things are going to go wrong and just go with it and enjoy it and have a go to laugh at yourself because laughter is a thing that you lose very quickly when you're struggling with pain and it feels a bit weird to laugh. But actually now I've encouraged my daughters to laugh at me if things go wrong. I, I did a, a, an online live event the other day and I, I was holding up some broccoli and I was calling it cauliflower for the whole thing. And my daughters didn't tell me the whole way through. They were just <laughs> wetting themselves laughing. But now it's a joke. You know, it probably would have tipped me over the edge 10 years ago. But now it's like, that's it. just enjoy it. You know, go with it. Yeah. Amazing advice. And I think we all just saw in that few minutes there exactly why you you might not see it, but we can see why you deserve to get called up by the likes of Nadex and to give these <laughs> talks because your passion is just amazing for it and some great advice and and I, I i often say to my other half she has to pick up a lot of the cooking because if I, by the end of the day i'm at my worst point i'm a morning yeah. person that gets worse um and i have to say it has to i have to have time to cook to enjoy yeah. it i can't do the rush thing and i'm very much music blasting kind of kind yeah. of person so yeah i can very much relate to that um <laughs> So, yeah, some of the questions we've got. Um, Simon's asked, I want to know the one dish you love making. I'm sure you love uh, making lots, but I suppose what's the one? That yeah, you, uh, if uh, you have to pick one. Probably the dish that sums up everything that I do is a bolognese. And the reason is that it, it's got, I use chops, frozen onion. I've got, uh, and sometimes I'll, I'll make it and it might be meat, it might be vegan, it might be gluten free, but it's still there. And the, the thing with the bolognese, the why I think it's the most amazing thing is one is it tastes great, but what once you've made it, if you make a little bit more than you need and then freeze it, I'm not saying batch cook because that fills me with horror of batch cooking. It's like <laughs> rows of Tupperware out into the wilderness. It's like, no. So make a bit and then put it away. And then what's that that is now in your freezer? When you're having a really bad day and you, like you say, at the end, you really can't do it. If you get that out of your freezer, you should celebrate the hell that you've still cooked because you might have made it three weeks ago, but it doesn't matter because you still made it. And you were thinking, actually, I'm going to need this someday. And you get it out and you heated it up, but you've cooked. And that bolognese, now you can turn it into loads of different dishes, add some spice for a chili, add you know, so many different things you can do. And that's really what I'm all about is making simple food help you rather than it being a disaster. Yeah, they're brilliant. Thank you. And uh, you're inspiring lots of people in the chat across the various platforms to start cooking. So you, you're clearly doing a good <laughs> <Yay>! job. <laughs> uh, one one that we got here from Nia is uh, they'd like to know how you do your famous uh, toast. Um, <laughs> how toasty and what topping? So um, uh, maybe more of a lower skill question. That <laughs> well, do you know what? A toast, it, it can still be hard if you either even if you've got a toaster or a or a grill it's still blooming hot so you can you can certainly you know you can cause yourself some damage initially just a bit of butter that's where it started but actually that toast formed the basis of the book that i wrote cookfulness because in there i've got eggy bread and eggy bread is just the most brilliant thing as well because it's just eggs and and bread that you that you sort of fry so it just because it's a piece of toast toast can then become croutons it can become all kinds of things so toast is a great skill, just like boiling an egg. So, yeah, but initially it was toast and butter. Brilliant. <laughs> and there's also a lot of dislike for batch cooking in, in chat as well. So you're not alone. You're yeah. not alone. <laughs> I think many of us have got um, ex first experiences that of like when we started going to the gym or something like that was yeah. like my first experience with it. And I was like, yeah, that was a big hard pass for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I call it little extra cooking now because it just feels a bit easier. It's just like making one bit more than you need. Put it in the freezer. You're done. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so where can people find your book, Ian? I feel like I probably should have asked this by now. So oh, uh, where can people find fine. that? If yeah, next? it's on Amazon and Waterstones and Goodreads, uh, just Cookfulness with one L. Um, and then also if you, on, on my website on cookfulness.co.uk, there's a link in there to it as well. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and like I say, anyone who's watching this back, because what we do is um, we we take we top and tail the interview only. So that if people just want to watch the interview, we'll put all of that in the description, guys. You'll have that um, available. Um, and I've now seen that people in chat started talking about Marmite, which feels like a really good point for us to wrap this up before <laughs> we go down that yeah. rabbit hole. <laughs> revolt and stuff in my opinion but there we yeah, go yeah i'm with you on that yeah, <laughs> yeah good <laughs> uh, ian thank you so much for joining us like generally um it's i'm gonna a bit of personal um info here guys like i still struggle even though we do all this every week and i do multiple streams every week i still struggle um especially with the with the talk show bit I, I, imposter syndrome i always feel like my guest is here and i'm down here and you yeah. know all day it's on the back of my mind but then within five minutes of these conversations i wake up and i realize exactly why we do this and and you are just like a, the perfect example of that like i could have talked to you for two three hours tonight um it was really so i would love i'd love to have you back maybe we could do like yeah. a, a cook and demo or something if, yeah, if we yeah, can make yeah. that work technically yeah. that'd be great definitely no i mean it, genuinely same for me i've been all day i've been so excited but petrified at the same time <laughs> <laughs> thinking, oh, am i going to freeze whatever but yeah i would love to come back and you know, if we wanted to do it again, I could send out a list of ingredients ahead and we could make something together, like literally oh, live be, as we be, do it, you know. That'd be terrifying, so, but amazing. Yeah, <laughs> but I'd, like make we... it, I'd make it very easy where you didn't need any heat or anything. It would just be something we could just do together and try it and actually eat it within the same time as making it. Yeah, that 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 sounds... Uh, there's lots of... um. Yeah, people are very excited about that in chat. So I feel like I've already committed myself to that. And so, yeah, we'll get that, I mean... <laughs> we'll get that booked in. Um, yeah. And if anyone wants to find you on social media or anything, um, do you want to just give yourself a little plug for that now? Yeah, thank you. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at Cookfulness. I say the website's www.cookfulness.co.uk. There's a YouTube channel, loads of free uh, recipes and demos on there. And if you get stuck with anything, you can just drop me a note and I'll try and help you. Superb. Yeah, um, thank you. On behalf of everyone here and just relaying what we've got to come through in chat, thank you so much for your time tonight. And yeah, we very much look forward to having you back. And then, then I will be very much the one under the spotlight and feeling nervous when we do our cooking demo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Genuinely, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's gen a real honour and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Brilliant. Absolutely wonderful, man. Thank you, Ian. Have a good rest of your evening and have a good week ahead. All right. Thank you. And you.